right uh, in this video we will be going over section uh, 4.7 uh, section 4.7 is about uh, functions defined by integrals okay in particular uh, we will be uh, talking about one of the most important uh, uh, theorems in this uh, chapter uh, which is what we call the second fundamental theorem of calculus all right i want to uh, start with uh, this definition definition 4.32 area accumulation functions okay let's see how we define uh, the area accumulate accumulation function for a given function lowercase f okay here is what the definition tells you suppose f is a continuous function on the closed interval a comma b then the area accumulation function for f on the closed interval a comma b is the function that for all x in the interval a comma b is equal to the sine area between the graph of f and the x axis on the interval a comma x that is defined by this equation okay a of x is the symbol for the area accumulation okay a x is the area accumulation function for f for lowercase f it is defined by the definite integral from a to x f of t dt Okay, that's how we define the area accumulation function. Here is the geometry behind this. What do you mean by the area accumulation function? Well, let's look at the geometry. Let's say you are given a graph uh, of a function like this. This is your A, this is your B. Okay, then let's say this is your Y is equal to F of X. The graph of Y is equal to F of X is given. What do you mean by the integration definite integral from a to x f of t dt? Let's say your x is somewhere here. You pick your x to be here, which is a variable, of course. If you pick your x to be somewhere here, what is the geometric meaning of this integral, definite integral? Definite integral of f of x from a to x. That means this area, right? If you integrate your function from a to x, it is going to be this area. By the way, since we don't have an absolute value here, this is going to be a signed area. But since this function is positive, it's going to be the area. It's going to be this area will be counted as a positive area. Basically, definite integral of f of t from a to x will be the area under the curve on the interval a comma x. Okay, that's why it's uh, it's called uh, the area accumulation function. If you move this x little bit to the right. Then you accumulate the area under the curve on the interval a comma x if you exist somewhere here. Okay. Likewise, when x is moving, your area is changing. Okay. By the way, it's a signed area. If your graph goes below the x-axis, you count the areas which are above the x-axis as positive areas and the areas below the x-axis as negative areas. For example, a situation like this. We have a graph like this. This time, say this is your A, this is your B. In that case, again, you can define the area accumulation function this way. This is, of course, A of X. But this time, if you X is somewhere here, of course, your uh, area will be positive. And if you X is somewhere here, then the way you find the area is you count this area as a positive area and this area as a negative area, and then you take the sum. Okay. That is the sign area. All right, that's the idea behind uh, the area accumulation function for a given function f. Let's move on. Next, I'm going to go over the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's uh, see what uh, the theorem tells us. If f is continuous on the closed interval a comma b, and we define f of x, uppercase f of x is equal to integration from a to x f of t dt for all x in this interval a comma b closed interval then the conclusion of the uh, theorem is uppercase f is continuous on the closed interval a comma b and differentiable on the open interval a comma b that's the first part and the second part tells us uh, uppercase f is an anti derivative of lowercase f that is, that means if you differentiate your uppercase f of x, you should get your lowercase f of x. 
That means if you have a function of this form, uppercase f of x is equal to the integral from a to x f of t dt, the derivative of this function is just the lowercase f of x. Okay, that's what the second part tells us. All right, uh, we are not going to prove this theorem, but we will be going over uh, some applications of uh, this theorem. Okay, the proof is in the book. I would encourage you to read it. All right, let's move on. Next, uh, we have this theorem, theorem 4.34, differentiating area accumulation functions. Here is what the theorem uh, statement tells you. If f is continuous on a comma b, then for all x in the closed interval a comma b, we have the derivative of this function, derivative of uh, definite integral from a to x, f of t dt is equal to f of x, okay? In a sense, this tells you that if we have an integration of this form, the derivative of this quantity, this uh, circled quantity, can be obtained by plugging this x here. You replace this t by x. That's when you get f of t, f of x, okay? So this uh, tells you how to differentiate an area accumulation function. This is, of course, the area accumulation function, right, that we saw earlier. And of course, this is a very straightforward uh, implication of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. By second fundamental theorem of calculus, if you take this part to be f, if you take uppercase f of x to be this definite integral a to x, f of t dt, then you can immediately see that from the second fundamental theorem of calculus, f prime of x is going to be f of x. By second fundamental theorem of calculus, if uppercase f of x is equal to integral uh, from a to x f of t dt, then f prime of x is lowercase f of x. So we should have f prime of x is lowercase f of x. But what is f prime? f prime means the derivative of this one. That is exactly this statement. d over dx, your uppercase f of x. Okay, that should be equal to f of x, lowercase f of x, okay? That's a straightforward application of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, let's move on. Uh, next, we have this uh, theorem, theorem 4.35, differentiating a composition involving an area accumulation function, okay? So here is uh, the statement of the uh, theorem. If f is continuous on the closed interval a comma b and u of x is differentiable on the closed interval a comma b, then for all x in the closed interval a comma b, we have this statement. What does this tell you? The derivative, d over dx means the derivative of whatever you put here, right? The derivative of this quantity is equal to this uh, expression, okay? What does this tell you? See. As you saw in the second fundamental theorem, in the second fundamental theorem, if you have x here, the answer is just f of x, right? If you go back to the second fundamental theorem, if you have just x here, if you differentiate this function, you will get just f of x. Or you can see that from this, even from this uh, differentiation of the area accumulation function, if you just have x here, the derivative of this whole thing will be just f of x. Now the question is, what if you have something different here? Some complicated expression in place of x. This answers that question, okay? This theorem answers that question. If you have something complicated here in place of x, then here is how you differentiate this function, okay? The derivative of this function would be, you simply plug in this u, u of x for your t. That's how you get f of u of x here, okay? You simply replace your t by this u of x. You put u of x here for t, okay? Then you get f of u, x, u of x, but you are not done. You have to pay a penalty for not having x here. If you have an x here, if you have just x here, then no penalty. But since you have something different from x, you have to pay the penalty. Penalties, you need to multiply that by the derivative of this complicated expression. 
you have to have u prime of x here okay actually this also can be uh, proven easily uh, if we define this one we have from the area accumulate differentiation of area accumulation function you have first of all this is uh, let's give a rough proof here uh, Let's take the area accumulation function a to x f of t dt. This is the area accumulation function. And we know that the derivative of the area accumulation function is going to be f of x. We all know that from the previous part. See, the derivative. This is the area accumulation function. This whole thing is nothing but the area accumulation function. a of x. Okay, so we know that the derivative of the area accumulation function is lowercase f of x. So we have this statement. All right, now what is what we need here is what is the derivative of yeah, first of all, notice that. Uh, a of u of x. What is a of u of x? If I plug in u of x here, u of x should come here, right? On the right hand side also, you need to replace ux by u of x. So this will be equal to a to u of x f of t dt, right? That's what exactly we have here. You need to take the derivative of this function, okay? That means you need to take the derivative of this function. Now, this is the composition of functions. We know how to uh, apply the chain rule to take the derivative of this function. So we can take the derivative of this function d over dx. Remember, we need the derivative of this quantity. That's what exactly we have. Derivative of this one is d over dx, this quantity. So we need the derivative of this one. Okay, derivative of that one means d over dx a of u of x. This is by chain rule, this is equal to a prime of u of x times the derivative of u of x. Now, what is a prime of u of x? I have a formula for a prime of x. So a prime of u of x would be, you need to replace this x by u of x. You need to replace your x by u of x to find a prime of u of x. You can use this equation to find a prime of u of x. You replace your x by u of x. Then you get f of u of x times u prime of x. That's what you wanted. The derivative of this uh, function should be f of u, u of x times u prime of x. We have it here. Okay. All right. That's a quick proof of uh, that theorem. Let's move on. Next, we are going to uh, define the natural logarithmic function, and we are going to talk about some properties of natural logarithmic function, okay? Here is how we define the natural uh, logarithmic function. The natural logarithmic function is the function for x greater than zero is defined by ln of x. We use ln of x for natural logarithmic of x, okay? Ln of x is equal to Definite integral from one to x, one over t dt. That's how we define the natural logarithm function, okay? Remember, always we define this function for x greater than zero. And you have seen the graph of ln of x. The graph looks like this. Everyone knows the graph uh, from pre-calculus, from your pre-calculus class, the graph looks like this. Of course, uh, x is equal to zero is a vertical asymptote. This number here is going to be one, okay? All right, next I want to talk about some properties of uh, this natural logarithmic function. Here are the properties that I want to talk about. First of all, let me copy this, uh, copy the graph of this function uh, to the other page so that I can refer to certain things. I'll copy it over to the other side. All right, here is the graph of uh, natural logarithmic 
function. So this is the graph of y is equal to ln of x, okay? All right, here are some properties. Uh, uh, properties are given by this uh, theorem, theorem uh, 4.37, properties of natural logarithmic function. Here is the first property, ln x is continuous on zero comma infinity, okay? On the interval zero comma infinity, notice that this is an open interval, okay? You can only talk about this open interval because you cannot include uh, zero because you have a vertical asymptote that x is equal to zero. So your function is not continuous at x is equal to zero. That's why you have open intervals, okay? In this interval, your function is continuous. Of course, you can see that from the graph, you can continuously draw this graph without taking your pen off the board. So it's a continuous uh, function, okay? And of course, you can even show that using uh, the definition that it's a continuous function, but uh, we will not be going to that uh, in this uh, section. And then uh, ln x is differentiable on the interval 0, comma infinity. It's not only continuous, it's differentiable on the open interval 0, comma infinity. And the derivative would be, we know the derivative from the previous uh, chapter, the derivative of ln, ln of x is 1 over x. Okay. And here is another property, ln of 1 is 0, which is clear from the graph. ln of 1 is equal to 0. When the input is x is equal to 1, your output is 0. ln of 1 is 0. And then ln of x is less than a zero on the interval zero comma one open interval. And ln of x is greater than zero on the interval one comma infinity. That's also clear, okay? On this interval zero comma one, your function is negative. And on the open interval one comma infinity, your function is positive. On this interval, your function is positive. What else? And then ln x is increasing on zero comma infinity open interval, okay? On this entire interval, your function is increasing. That's also clear. As you can see, your graph is going up when your x goes from left to right, okay? Your graph uh, keeps going up like this. So it's an increase in function. And ln x is concave down on the interval uh, zero comma infinity. As you can see from the graph, it is concave down. In fact, you can justify this by finding the second derivative, okay? The second derivative has to be uh, negative you will see that the second derivative is negative and hence your uh, graph is concave down like this all right and then the uh, last property is ln x is one to one on the interval zero comma infinity that's also clear okay pause the video and think about that why it is one to one you should remember some theorem from your pre-calculus class That is by horizontal line test, okay? If you uh, draw any horizontal line, that horizontal line intersects your graph in at most one point, okay? As you can see, this uh, horizontal line intersects only at this point, this particular x value, okay? Likewise, if you take any horizontal line, it's going to intersect your graph at most at one point. So it's a one-to-one -one function by horizontal line test. All right, so that's about that theorem. Now let's move on. Next, we are going to uh, work on some examples. So here is the first example that I want to uh, work on. Suppose f is the function shown here, which is shown here, of course, and define the area accumulation function a of x is equal to definite integral from one to x f of t dt, use the graph of f to answer the following question, okay? The first part asks us to determine uh, which one is larger, a2 or a3, okay? Part a, how do you determine which one is larger? To determine that, you need to understand first what we mean by a2. By definition, a2 is, see, this is the area accumulation function, a2 would be, 1 to 2, the definite integral 1 to 2 f of t dt. You plug in x is equal to 2. 1 to 2 f of t dt. And of course, a of 3 would be the definite integral from 1 to 3 f of t dt. Then you need to understand the geometric meaning of this. What do you mean by definite integral from one to two f of t dt? 
here is the graph of f of x. Okay, the definite integral from 1 to 2 ft dt means that's the area under the curve, the signed area under the curve on this interval, 1, 2. Okay, so that is this area. That is this area. Okay, this definite integral is nothing but that area. That means a of 2 is that area. What is a of 3? That is the definite integral from 1 to 3, f of t dt, that is the area under the curve on the interval 1 to 3 this time. That is this area. As you can see, that area is clearly bigger than the previous area. Because though both of those areas are counted as positive areas, but this area is bigger. So this has to be bigger than a of 2. a of 3 has to be bigger than a of 2 because you uh, collect more area, you collect more positive area, or you accumulate more positive area. So this implies that a of 3 is bigger than a of 2. Then how do you compare these two, a of 3 and a of 6? Well, again, a of 3 is the definite integral from 1 to 3, f of t dt, that means the area under the curve, the signed area under the curve on the, on the interval 1, 3, that is this area. That is this area. Perhaps I will mark that in green. One, two, three, that is this area. Okay. Next, we need to compare this area against A of 6. What is A of 6? To find A of 6, you need to find the area under the curve on this interval 1, 6. Notice that A of 6 is nothing but integration from 1 to 6 this time f of t dt okay that is the signed area on this interval now this when you count that area this area is common for both when you go from 1 to 3 and 1 to 6 you always count this area as a positive area but when you continue from 3 to 6 the rest of the journey you are collecting some positive area that's true but you are collecting more negative area. This area is, this negative area is bigger than this small positive area. So that means you are accumulating more negative area when you go from three to six, okay? So as a result, your A of six has to be smaller than, or A of three has to be bigger than A of six. A of three is still bigger than uh, A of six because when you go to a, uh, uh, six from three, you are accumulating more negative area, okay? So A of three has to be bigger than A of six. All right, let's move on. Next part, list intervals on which A of X is increasing and decreasing, okay? In which interval is A of X is increasing and in which intervals it is decreasing. Well, to find out, first of all, remember, uh, we are starting from A, okay? We are considering the inter integration from A to X. For example, if your X is somewhere on this interval, say for example, your X is here, then A of X is the area under the curve on the interval one comma X, right? This area. A of x is that one. And if you increase x a little bit, you accumulate more positive area. That means as long as you exist in this, pardon me, as long as you exist in this region, A of x is increasing because A of x is, if you exist here, your A of x is the area under the curve in that region. And if you move your x a little bit to the right, that is the area under the curve on that interval that is bigger. Okay, as long as your x is in this interval, a of x is increasing. And as long as your x is in this interval, your a of x is decreasing. Because when you go further on this interval, for example, if your x is here, you have a negative area accumulated here, and you have a positive area, of course, here on this interval. And if you go a little further to the right, then you accumulate more negative area. As a result, your A of X is decreasing. That means as long as your X is in this region, 
your a of x is decreasing because you are accumulating negative area as long as you are on an interval where your function is positive you are accumulating positive areas okay positive areas increases the value of a of x okay when you go further on this interval you gain more positive area again on this interval if you are on the interval 7 to 8 again you are your a of x is increasing because you are accumulating more positive area when you go from left to right on this interval okay so the intervals where a of x is increasing would be uh, 1 to 4 and 7 to 8 and the intervals where a of x is decreasing would be 4 to 7 okay let's try it eight. Okay, so the area accumulation function a is increasing on the interval 1 comma 4 and 7 comma 8. 1 comma 4 means the interval where your function is positive. Again, 7 comma 8 is the interval where your function is again positive. Okay, whenever your function is positive on an interval, a of x is increasing because you are accumulating a more area when you go for, to, to further right. Okay, whenever your function is negative on a particular interval, on that interval, for all the x values on that interval, you are function x a, function a of x is decreasing because you are accumulating negative area when you go from left to right along the x-axis on that interval. All right, let's go to the next part. Sketch a rough graph of the function a of x on the interval 1 comma 8. How do you sketch a rough graph uh, of a of x? Well, first of all, notice that Notice that on this interval, your function a of x is increasing because your original function lowercase f is positive. So your area accumulation function is increasing. When you go from left to right, you are accumulating more positive area. Okay. On this interval, area accumulation function is decreasing because on this interval, when you go to further right, you accumulate negative areas. As a result, your area accumulation function will be uh, decreasing. And on this interval, again, your area accumulation function is increasing. So we should have a shape like this. Let's say this is 1. We need 1 to 8. The breaking points are going to be 4. 4 is here. Let's say 7 is here. Those are the points. And on the interval 1 to 4, it's increasing. I know that. Okay. So I will draw it like this. 1 to 4, it's increasing. And 4 to 7, it should be decreasing. Should be coming down like this. And then 7 to 8, again, it is increasing. Okay, 7 to 8, it should be increasing. So it should be a graph like this. I don't know uh, beyond 8. I don't know. I don't have any information about my function beyond 8. But at least up to 8, I know that it is increasing. This should be a shape of the graph of y is equal to ax. y is equal to ax or my area shape of the area accumulation function. Now here you might ask me, like here in this interval, let me actually mark that. So one to four, clearly area accumulation function is increasing because your graph is positive and then from 4 to 7, your area accumulation function is decreasing because your graph is original function is negative in that case. Okay. And 7 to 8, it is uh, positive. So here, as you can see, I did not come below the x axis here. I could have come below the x axis. What do you think? Why didn't I come below the x axis? How do I know that it, uh, it stays above the x axis somewhere here? Why it cannot come down all the way here and turn back and goes up? Well, that is based on the observation. If you look at this, we are considering the interval from 1 to x, right? If you look at here, this area, this area is bigger than this area, right? So when you are accumulating areas, when you x is x goes from here to here, no matter where your x is line in this interval, your signed area is positive because this 
area this area is positive and it is bigger than this area okay as a result there is no chance that your uh, a of x is uh, becoming negative okay you, your a of x cannot uh, be negative because uh, this area is bigger than this negative area okay so that's why i have drawn the graph this way there's no chance that it will come down and uh, go below the x-axis all right let's move on to the uh, next part use the graph of f and a to verify that one of these functions is the derivative of the other function what do you think Okay, clearly from the second fundamental theorem of calculus or the, or the uh, derivative of the area accumulation function, we know that a prime of x is equal to f of x. So we have the graph of a of x here and we have the graph of uh, f of x here. Okay, so as you can see, if you look at the derivative of, derivative of this function, a of x, on this region, my derivative is positive because it's increasing. Okay, derivative is positive. As you can see, your lowercase f is positive on that interval. Okay, that means we can fairly see that from this graph, this is the derivative of this function by just using the graph. Yeah, I'm not using anything else. See, this is increasing on this interval. And of course, here the derivative is zero. So, your function lowercase f. The derivative of this function has to be positive on this interval 1 to 4. It is positive here. And then at x is equal to 4, it becomes 0. That makes sense because here the tangent derivative of the tangent is the slope of the tangent is 0. And then on this interval, my a of x is decreasing. Decreasing means the derivative is negative. Okay. So if this is the derivative, uh, as you can see, the derivative is negative. I'm claiming that the derivative of a is f. Okay, that's clear from the graph because on this interval, my a of x is uh, decreasing. And of course, this f is negative in that interval. That means the derivative is negative. Okay, on this interval, 7 to 8, your derivative is positive here. Derivative of a of x is positive because a of x is increasing on that interval. As you can see here, your f lowercase f is positive in that interval because the derivative of a of x is positive. Okay, so clearly uh, this f is the derivative of a, and from from these graphs it is clear. You can clearly see that from these graphs. All right, let's uh, move on. All right, next I want to go over this uh, particular example. Uh, find the derivatives of each of the following functions. The first function given to us is this uh, function. Part A, as you can see, uh, this is a straightforward application of second fundamental theorem of calculus. Think of this as your f of t, lowercase f of t, and you have the integration from one to x. You can compare that integration with this integration a to x of course your a in this case is one and your f of t is whatever you have here so this is the function that you have uppercase f of x and the derivative of that function f prime of x is even is going to be lowercase f of x okay all what you need to do is you need to plug in this variable x for t Okay, so all what you need to do here is by second fundamental theorem of calculus, you replace your t by x. You replace your t by x. So by second fundamental theorem of calculus, second fundamental theorem of calculus, we have f prime of x is equal to cosine ln of x divided by e to the power sine x squared. All you do is you replace your uh, t by x. So this is the derivative of 
low, uh, uppercase f of x. All right, let's move on to the next part. What do you think here? Can you take the derivative straight away using the second fundamental theorem of calculus in this case? Well, not because as you can see in the second fundamental theorem of calculus, this constant is the lower limit and the x is the upper limit. But here, x is the lower limit, the constant is the upper limit. Okay, so you cannot apply that straight away. But the good thing is we can use the properties of uh, definite integral to write this integral the way we want. In the second case, f of x is, I'm going to put a minus sign in front and switch the limits, two to x. Definite integral from two to x, ln of t dt. I can switch these two limits by putting the minus sign in front. That's what I did. That's one of the properties of definite integral. Now I'm set to apply the second fundamental theorem of calculus for this quantity. I can take the derivative of this function, okay? Of course, I can take the derivative of all things. This minus one is just a constant. It's, it stays outside. Now you can apply the second fundamental theorem of calculus, okay? Let me write by second fundamental theorem of calculus, we have if prime of x is equal to, don't forget the minus sign in front, that is going to be ln of x. To take the derivative of this one, all what you need to do is you plug in this variable x here for t. Okay, so that gives the answer. All right, let's uh, move on. Okay, here is the next example that I want to uh, go over. Find the derivatives of each of the following functions. Okay, the first function given to us is uppercase f of x is uh, the definite integral uh, from zero to x squared secant x dt. So how do you find the derivative of the first uh, function? f prime of x. Well, it's a straightforward application of this particular theorem. Okay, differentiate in a composition involving area accumulation function. Okay, so in other words, it tells you how to differentiate a function like this. How to differentiate definite integral from a to u, u of x, f of t dt. This looks like this is your a, this is your u of x. Notice that you cannot apply the second fundamental theorem straight away because this is not x. It's, it's some complicated function this time. So for that, you need to apply this theorem. So how do you differentiate this function? That is equal to f of u of x times u prime of x. All what you do is you plug in this u of x for your t. You replace your t by u of x. That's how you get f of u of x here. And then you multiply that thing by u prime of x, the derivative of this quantity. Let's do it here. So this is very straightforward application of Theorem 4.35, okay? So this will be secant, you plug in x squared for your t, you replace your t by x squared, times the derivative of u of x. u of x is uh, your x squared, the derivative of x squared is 2x, done, okay? You would say by theorem 4.35. Okay, that's the first part. Now let's move on to the second part. How do we find the derivative of uh, uppercase f of x in the second part? f prime of x, first of all, let me explain a few things here. We have uh, uppercase f of x is equal to uh, definite integral uh, from zero to three x, uh, x over t squared plus one, dt, okay? Here, as you can see, this x looks like a constant because the integration variable is dt. Integration variable is t. You have dt here and you have the variable t here. Looks like this x is a constant. So this x works out first. So let me pull that out. So your f of x is nothing but, you pull out your x because x is a constant in the integration because the integration variable is t, not x. Zero to three x, one over t squared plus one dt. Now you can apply this theorem. 
now you can apply this theorem to find the derivative of uh, this function how do you apply that theorem to find the derivative notice that we have a product here this is the first function this is the second function so we apply the product rule okay first you take the uh, derivative of uh, this first function and leave the other function fixed and then you take the derivative, uh, leave the first function fixed and take the derivative of the other function, okay? View this as a product. So if I take the derivative of the first function, it is one, derivative of x is one times, one times integration zero to three x, one over t squared plus one dt, plus this time you fix the first function fixed and you, uh, differentiate the second function. How do you differentiate this function? Well, to differentiate that function, this theorem is going to help you, okay? Here, unfortunately, we don't have x here, so we cannot apply the second fundamental theorem of calculus straight away, but thanks to this theorem, we can still differentiate this function, okay? All what you do is you plug in three of x for your t, and then multiply that by the derivative of this one. So that will be, Okay, the derivative of this function will be, you just plug in three of x for your t, you replace your t by uh, three of x in this function, then you get this expression times the derivative of this three of x. That's what this rule tells you. You plug in this u of x in the function uh, f of t, you replace your t by u of t, u of x, and then you multiply that by u prime of x. That's what I did here. U prime of x is the derivative of this one is three. Okay, so this is the answer. If you want, you can simplify this a little bit by multiplying these two and getting rid of this one. All right, so that completes that example. Let's move on. Next, I want to go over this example. Use pictures and properties of definite integrals to illustrate that ln of 0 0.5 is negative, ln of 3 is positive, and ln of 4 is greater than uh, ln of 3, okay? First of all, recall that, how did we uh, define the definition of ln of x is 1 to x, 1 over t dt. That was the definition. We define our logarithmic function that way, okay? ln of x is the definite integral from 1 to x, 1 over t dt. Okay. All right. So with that definition, how do we justify that ln of 0 0.5 is negative? Well, it's not bad. Okay. So by this definition, clearly ln of 0 0.5 is going to be Definite integral from 1 to 0 0.5. I'm replacing my x by 0 0.5, okay? That's all I'm doing, dt, okay? But the, here, this is the smaller number. This is the bigger number. This is the smaller number. I can write this as minus times 0 0.5 to 1, 1 over t dt. What does this mean now? Forget about this minus sign. What does this mean? This means the area under the curve, one over t on the interval zero comma five to one, right? That's what this means. This means the area under this curve one over t on the interval zero comma five to one. Here is my graph one over t. I know the shape of the graph one over t. This is the graph of y is equal to one over t. I need to take the area under this curve, under the graph of one over t on this interval, 0 0.5 to one. 0 0.5 to one means this interval. That means this area. As you can see, that area is a positive area because your graph lies above the x-axis on that area. So you count that area as a positive area. So this area will be positive. This number will be positive but you have a minus sign in front. That will make everything negative, okay? That's how 
you conclude that ln of uh, 0 0.5 is negative. This is clearly negative. Because this quantity is clearly positive. You have a minus sign in front. All right, next, how do we justify that ln of three is positive? Again, the definition. By definition, ln of three is equal to integration from integration uh, definite integral from one to three this time one over t dt now think about the geometry of this definite integral i have the graph of one over x the graph of one over x is is given here okay what do you mean by the definite integral of one over x one over t from one to three that is the area under the curve 1 over t on the interval 1 to 3. The interval 1 to 3 is this interval. The area under the curve is a positive area because your function is positive in that interval. Now, this time you don't have any minus signs in front. Okay, so this is going to be a positive quantity by the geometry of this picture. Clearly positive. Okay, I will drag that over here. This area is positive. All right, next, uh, ln4. Uh, no, actually, uh, ln4 is uh, positive. Uh, we can also justify that. We need to make uh, show that ln4 is greater than ln3. Again, you look at ln4. What's the quantity ln4? ln4 is integral, definite integral from 1 to 4 this time, 1 over t dt. That is the area under the curve 1 over t on the interval 1 to 4. That is this area. This is the interval 1 to 4. The area under the curve will be this area. And as you can see clearly, this area is bigger than this area. This is given by this definite integral 1 to 3. So clearly, ln of 4 is bigger than ln of 3. Okay, that uh, completes that example. Let's uh, move on to our last example. Here is the example I want to uh, go over. Use Riemann sums with four rectangles to find upper and lower bounds for ln3. Okay. Uh, first of all, by definition, we know that ln3 is the definite integral from 1 to 3, 1 over t dt. Here is the graph of uh, 1 over t on the interval uh, one to three, on the interval one to three, this is the graph. And uh, we are asked to find uh, an upper bound and a lower bound. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find Riemann sums, okay? I'm going to find the left sum and the lower sum. You will see that in this case, the left sum will be an upper bound for the area under the curve. And, oh, first of all, this is, Let's understand the geometry of this integral, ln of 3. Uh, ln of 3 means the definite integral from 1 to 3, 1 over t dt. That means the area under the curve on the interval 1, 3. That's what we mean by that definite integral, 1 to 3, 1 over t dt. Okay. So we need to find an approximation for this area or for this area. Okay. This is ln 3. The area is nothing but ln 3. So how do you find an approximation for this area? For that, I'm going to find the uh, lower sum, Riemann lower sum and upper sum using four rectangles. I'm going to divide this uh, interval into four subintervals, and then I'm going to compute the left sum. You will see that if you compute the left sum for these four rectangles, it's going to be an overestimate for the area under the curve. Why is it an overestimate? If you go to the first interval, the left end point is this one. If you evaluate the function height at that left end point, this is the height. 
with that type if you complete the rectangle do you see that the area of that rectangle is an overestimate for the area under the curve in that interval likewise if you go to the second interval and if you evaluate your function height at the left end point of the second interval that is this side if you complete the rectangle with that height you get an overestimate for the area under the curve the, the area of this rectangle is an overestimate for the area under the curve in that interval okay likewise all the rectangles will be overestimate for the area under the curve in that uh, given interval so if you add up the summation of areas of these four rectangles that will be an overestimate for uh, for the area under the curve that means all i have to do is i have to find the left sum uh, for these rectangles and of course if you find the right sum you will see that it's an underestimate for your area under the curve that's because of if you go to the first interval the right end point is this one if you evaluate the function height at the right end point and complete the rectangle the area of this rectangle is clearly less than the area under the curve in that interval okay likewise for all these four rectangles you will see that the area the area of the rectangle is an underestimate for the area under the curve as a result the sum of the areas of these four rectangles will be an underestimate for the area of under the curve so all i need to do is i need to find the riemann uh, right sum and the uh, left sum okay here is the formula for the right sum and here is the formula for the uh, left sum right sum will be an underestimate that means it, it will be a lower bound and the left sum will be an upper bound okay so first of all you can of course identify this x0 x1 x2 x3 x4 this way because your interval is 1 to 3 you can easily identify those points this is 1.5 x1 is 1.5 x2 is 2 x3 is uh, 2.5 and x4 is 3 okay and then you can apply this uh, left sum formula to find the uh, left Riemann sum and the left Riemann sum would be if you calculate that that will be 1.28333 okay similarly you can uh, find the right Riemann sum using this formula and if you calculate that you will get uh, this value 0.95 as you can see the right Riemann sum is an underestimate for the uh, uh, area under the curve and this left Riemann sum will be an overestimate for the area under the curve okay so this is a lower bound this is an upper as we need area under the curve means ln of three remember area under the curve on the interval one comma three that means this area means ln of three okay so ln of three should be between 0 0.95 and 1.28333 all right, with that, we uh, conclude section 4.7 and I'll stop there. I'll see you next time.